Welcome everybody at this new episode of Playgrounds TV and it's a special one because we are going to explore, discuss uh, with a really set of really clever people um, the topic of NFTs, uh, crypto art, uh, because from the community we got like a lot of feedback and responses on what's NFT and what's happening over there and should I invest in it, should I don't, should I work in NFTs, should we change our curriculum at art academies, so there's a much going on on this topic. And today we're going to explore, see if it's a hype, is it there to last, should it be more sustainable, is it actually a good thing for artists or is it a bad thing for artists. So we're going to discuss it from different levels, also with different perspectives. So we invited four people that have like different of perspectives on digital art. On the, I don't know if the left or the right side online, we'll check it out. I don't, uh, we don't care which side of the screen, but there is my friend Rizon Parain. He is a founder of Us By Night, which is uh, a design and creativity festival. He's also a digital artist uh, making great, nice of 3D art. Um, next to Rizon, uh, it's Merel van Helsdingen. She is like the founder and managing director of Next Museum, which is a muse museum dedicated to new media art and actually exposes really great installations that you are able to experience over there. Then we have Nick Den Boer. He's a former guest of Playgrounds that actually conquered the stage with his digital art. Uh, he's also a director of animation, independent and commercially. Uh, and he is also like working on NFTs and, and exploring the whole possibilities around uh, NFTs. And uh, there is Dana Linze. She is a philosopher. She's a teacher. She's a curator. She's a writer uh, of articles, critical art articles on um, film, audiovisual art and digital art. So uh, I think a really, really great set of people who are able to explore what NFT is all about. Um, and just to start, uh, it's good to have like a, a fundament and I'm going to ask it to Nick. Um, Nick, uh, NFTs, you heard about it. Um, what's an NFT and why, do you why, why, did you, why did you start working with NFTs uh, as a digital artist? Cool. Um, well, thanks for having me, first of all, and uh, it's great to be here. And uh, an NFT is a non-fungible token. So it's, it's a digital token that exists online on the blockchain that's verified by tons of computers. So it's very hard to dispute. And uh, it's basically a digital token that represents a digital file. So um, you can, it can really be anything. It can be an audio file. It could be an image. It could be all kinds of different things that's represented by this secure, you know, serial number sort of on the internet. So it's kind of like attaching a serial number that somebody can own to a piece of digital artwork or, or anything really on, on online. So. Um, it's kind of almost like having a, a deed to a house, having this secure thing that proves that you have digital ownership of the file. So it's been very attractive to digital artists to finally be able to sell their work and have like a guaranteed owner on something that can normally be copied a million times. And like, to, how do you sell something like that? So it's kind of provided this convenient solution to be able to, you know, create this marketplace and sell a piece of digital artwork. And it's gained a lot of popularity. It's like I said, it's not limited to artwork. You've got like the NBA selling, you know, highlights from their basketball games as NFTs. Um, m music's coming into the space, 3D models, all kinds of things. So it's kind of like an, a new frontier in a lot of ways. And we're in the really early stages. So it's kind of messy. There's a lot of problems with it. I'm, I'm by no means a like 100% gung-ho, everything is awesome about NFTs guy because there are lots of problems, but it's also very exciting and there's, you know, like anything in its infancy, it's uh, it's working kinks out and, and starting out, but I think it is going to be here for the long haul and there, it, it's not going away and I think that it's got a lot of interesting uses coming up in the future. So, I mean, that's what attracted me to it is just like, I, I mean, I went to art school in 1998 when people were trying to sell their digital art uh, VHS tapes and it was laughed at. It's like ridiculous. Who's going to buy a digital art on a VHS? It was this worthless thing that you buy at a, you know, convenience store, a VHS tape, a blank tape, like with your art on it, you know? So it's really, it's been 20 something years now where people really couldn't sell their digital art 
uh, or it wasn't really taken seriously and there's no place to sell uh, your digital animation, which can have great ideas and can be like fine art. So yeah. it's, it's attractive to me in that way. Hey, and Nick, and how does the trajectory look like? So you build something, you make an animation or like, like, a, like a nice clip. How does it mm -hmm. look like? What are you doing to make it an NFT that actually people buying it? What, what's the trajectory well, of it? That's kind of the hard thing because if you really think, I, I guess like any art form, you just want to make your art and throw it out there and hopefully people buy it. But it's, uh, it's not like a normal art market here. You're selling to people who are rich in cryptocurrency. It's a very narrow demographic of people. You're not selling to rich art collectors in the traditional sense at all. So it's kind of like... I guess the question is, do you change your art to sell it in this market or do you just sell the artwork you normally make anyway? Because it's not just like anything is selling in this market that would normally sell in, in an art market. It's it's a bit more specific in a lot of ways. But I think the, the like for me, I always just I like to make detailed work and I like to, you know, make something that impresses me and is interesting and you know throw it out there and see what happens but i i've been focusing on making short loops at first i thought like you know doing more cinematic stuff would sell but i think people still are in the idea that crypto art and nft is something that you could possibly hang on your wall and put on a loop and like you still and p and collectors are thinking about it as a thing of showing off their collection we've got digital are, are, are some of the big collectors are creating online galleries in, in the metaverse on these like places like Decentraland where they're building physical 3D galleries in this virtual space and showing off their collections. And so you got to kind of think about how it's going to be displayed in the future now that it's it's maybe not going to be on a video loop on, a, on somebody's wall on a 4K screen. It might be totally on, in the web in some cool 3D space hanging on the wall. So, I mean, there's there's a lot of ways to think about it. And I mean, for me, it was just I felt like my style already kind of lent itself to this world and people, you know, were attracted to it. I posted some stuff early on on Super Rare and they retweeted it and a whole lot of collectors followed me and liked it. So I think maybe my stuff resonated with the collector base hey, that but was already there. But, but for those who are just like quite new in NFT and just tuning in. So mm -hmm. what I just ask is like you have like this video clip. What yeah. are the steps actually to get it to an oh, auction sure. and that it's sold and that it's like bringing in the money you were talking about from yeah, this? Yeah, uh, so, so there is there is a bit of a barrier of entry. You got to kind of understand the cryptocurrency. You first need to get some cryptocurrency before you start because it's not free. It does cost money in gas fees and it's kind of like a sort of taxation on on uh, transactions on the Ethereum network where you have to pay a fee to uh, for the processing power to mint your artwork. So you have to, it, and when I started out, it was maybe like $14 and I've paid as high as $300 to mint a piece of artwork. So it is substantial. It's kind of, you know, like I said, a barrier of entry. So you need to first uh, get a hold of some cryptocurrency, put some euros, I guess, in a, uh, or dollars into an exchange, exchange it for Ethereum. And it, or, or there's other networks, too, that are uh, also uh, not based on Ethereum, but there's all kinds of different platforms. But I use the ones on Ethereum right now. And uh, so you, you convert some dollars to Ethereum, so you have some money to uh, tokenize your artwork. Then you tokenize your artwork, put it on one of these sites. They're all kind of different, and they all have different auctioning protocols. Like some of them, you can set a reserve price where you say, okay, I made this cool animation loop. I want $1,000. So you can set it at point five ethereum or something like that and you let it sit on super rare and then if somebody hits your price it triggers an auction and everyone can have a chance to bid and hopefully you sell your work or you can set just a, a buy now price just it's kind of like ebay in that way all right hey but and tokenize your artwork it's like it's it sounds a little bit surrealistic tokenize so mm -hmm. you actually you make you if i understand correctly you have you created uh, an art piece and then you tokenize it which means you translate it into a kind of a unique pin code or exactly. like a, a, okay and, and it's it's uh, that's a little program or what kind of files do you need to upload so that people are sure that this is the original file so what's actually what are you tokenizing a lot of the artworks uh, or a lot of these platforms have a file size limit. Like I know Super Rares is 50 megabytes. So that's also what's kind of dictated the, um, the, the work in a lot of ways because you can't upload a feature film at a good quality on these websites and stuff like that. So like I said, I've been focusing on loops of a certain length of a certain resolution that look really good maxed out at 50 megabytes 
which is on, on their servers. But th this is a the thing. There's also it's very important to note there's different kinds of um, <clears throat> NFTs. Some some of these uh, there is such a thing as on chain. Uh, artwork, which is the artwork that's actually embedded on the blockchain. So it is on there and it is part of the, the blockchain and it's very limiting because it can't be really huge size because it will bog down the network. And so a lot of these websites actually host the content on their servers and all you're buying when you buy these NFTs is a token that represents the artwork. Like I said, you don't own your house, you own a deed to your house. You know what I mean? Like it's still just a thing that represents the artwork. So that's a big criticism that NFTs have gotten is like, okay, Super Rare has all this artwork on their servers, but what if they sell it to Viacom or some big company and all of a sudden they own all the artwork on there? So, you know, do you really own the artwork? Is the artwork really there? Is it, can they start charging you to host the artwork? Didn't they charge collectors to host the artwork? There's a lot of questions around it that need to be, Kind of answered but the good thing is is that these tokens are transferable so what i've been doing with my artwork is i have been doing 4k renders i give i give the owner the first owner of my artwork a digital file in the mail and i also give them a print so they have something tangible as well but i give them a digital file that's better quality than the one that i've put on the internet so the owner the person who bought my artwork first owns a better quality one and if their token ever did get disconnected from the server that it's on, from the platform it's on, they can repopulate it on another platform because they have the file. Now it's up to them to sell it to the next owner. And if they don't, I mean, it's not my problem, but it's I think it's more valuable if they do sell it to the next person. But that would spin kind of my solution to deal with that in case it does fail. But I'm also open if, if some server goes down and Super Rare doesn't exist anymore and a collector of mine asks me for the file, I will give it to them and they can re put it up wherever they want. So, I mean... All right. There are some issues around it, and the you know the idea of what is the artwork on the blockchain, what is the token, is definitely a philosophical one. Hey, Emil, a, a question uh, for you. Why do you think that digital artists are so embracing this? Why is it such a? There's like Bitcoin is already existing a little bit longer, but now it actually uh, is is like yeah, you know, exploding. Why is this the moment? that it explodes among uh, digital artists, do you think? Well, I think, so digital art has, has obviously been around for, for quite a while, since uh, I think the 80s were a really popular time as well, especially in the Netherlands, um, and it's been growing since. But when I was building Next Museum and when we were working on the curation, um, we have quite a few digital artworks in there, and we really noticed that um, to show a digital artwork physically, a lot of cultural spaces are not ready yet. They didn't have the infrastructure. They don't have the, you know, the height, the power. Uh, they don't have the knowledge often. Um, and often still the collections tend to stay quite traditional because it's still new, relatively new. So, so I think on the one hand, physically, um, it starts growing, but there wasn't a huge market for displaying this type of art outside of the world of festivals and um, really dedicated museum spaces. So I think when finally digitally, like online, um, artists started to be able to monetize their work, I think that has been a huge, huge shift um, for the makers. And, and it, it already started last year to become quite big in October. I think that people did a big drop that started to make a lot of money. And then January, February started exploding. March has been the biggest explosion, I think. But I've been following it for a while. And I think the fact that Christie's then jumped in and really gave it a stamp of kind of well, yeah, approval, if you like, to say, okay, this is here to stay and this art is valuable and, you know, you should really all focus and look into this because, it, yeah, it's serious. So I think that trend has been a really, really big deal, I would say, for artists in the field to really be taken seriously for the first time. All right. Hey, and uh, so... But it gives a lot of opportunities uh, to distribute your art, but because of Christie's, so there is a kind of a money aspect in it as well, that actually was like the trigger of the waterfall of art that is now dropped, right? Uh, is that correct, uh, uh, Dana? 
do you do you think like what Sachi did like uh, a few years ago, of a few years ago, already some decades ago, with like buying the art for uh, for example from Damien Hirst, like the, the shark on uh, uh, at, at, at quite a famous work, and he actually put like a lot of uh, there was like this group of British artists that made like painting with blood and making this uh, uh, s I, I don't know the English word for it, but like the shark on water. Um, and uh, he was investing like millions in it and put it in the Sachi gallery, which gave it like a kind of value immediately. It was from like starting artists that it gave a, a value of like millions and then it was taken seriously immediately. Uh, it's also with like for people's work, for instance, it's of course five, de five, piece five thousand pieces of work he did like daily, uh, digital art. And it was sol uh, sold as a collection, but it was sold for like <coughs> almost 70 million dollars, etc. So it ga gave immediately a lot of value to digital art. Is that something that has a history in fine art? Does it does it work that way, or is that is that a reason why it's so huge now? I find it really interesting that you would that you would mention <coughs> uh, Saatchi and and kind of him buying all these kind of new British artists. But Sachi was a collector, um, and that's probably different than what now happened um, with Christie's functioning as an auction house, making the transition from an online uh, crypto world and also from the, the online world of cryptocurrency in a way back into the material world of, I don't know, we, we don't have money in our hands anymore, but still kind of um, the tangibility of money where it's kind of dollars in hands. So I think this kind of marks an important moment where somehow the digital realm and the material or the actual realm somehow started to intertwine. And this is how it could become mainstream. But of course, Christie's is not a is not a collector. You do have collectors of, of digital art and, and crypto art or art that is kind of being put on the marketplace um, and, and being bought and sold through cryptocurrency. Um, so there's many things I think we need to unpack and, and kind of untangle here because, yes, uh, we have an, a new form of adding uh, value or worth. To, to an artwork, um, but we also have the, and I really see it like this, like a revolutionary or utopian um, momentum or possibility um, where you can start to think about curating and collecting and, uh, and also the whole discourse about art in a new and different way, because um, in a way you, you have the possibility to take out the traditional gatekeepers and the traditional middlemen. So there could be a more one-on-one -on -one relationship between the artist and the and the the whether it be like the the, the buyer or the collector or uh, just the art lover. Um, but at the same time, you see that the current platforms that uh, deal in crypto art function de facto is again as gatekeepers so what i like about it and i'm really new to this coming from film as you're saying and 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 digital media or or moving media art is kind of analyzing and trying to understand this momentum and as nick was saying earlier it is a new frontier it's messy and what i like about it is that it's messy because this is also where you really get to ask those kind of questions like okay what has the art world the traditional art world really become when it comes to money and when it comes to own your ownership and when it comes to questions around value and authenticity and is there actually a possibility to create a more democratic or a more horizontal way of talking about art um, of distributing art of enjoying arts but also is there a possibility for a lot of artists that before actually couldn't make any money out of their artwork because also once again as nick was saying yeah you would have this vhs tape in your hand well actually i kind of like it because i do have some it's it's also <laughs> the, the beauty of obsolete media um but yeah what was it actually what you're what you were having and with a digital file of course and also the possibility that you can copy it endlessly like what are you having is it is it a copy machine 
or is it something more? And now these NFTs created some kind of a certificate of ownership. Um, anyway, so there's for me, it's really the revolutionary utopian, but also messy potential that I find interesting about it. All right. Hey, Rizon, um, if I may ask you the question, uh, I hear some like kind of positive things like it's a digital revolution, it's NFT, there's a, a huge uh, potential on distribution and, and make it accessible. As a digital artist, you didn't step in yet, uh, or maybe never. Uh, why not, well, Rizon? What was your <laughs> vision on this? Uh, well, kind of... It's it's difficult because um, um, I don't know. Um, I, on first sight, uh, I was immediately like, "Well, what's happening here?" And um, the, the curation was really really bad. Um, and I was like, "Well, here's an, an interesting void. Maybe through our event as by night, we could set up such a platform and and uh, and and give return a favor to the community and to our speakers and and." Uh, facilitate that without any fees or whatsoever. Um, but I immediately actually contacted my my web developer and said, like, uh, start building this. We we need to uh, join. Um, but then I learned more about um, the ecological impact, and and I was I was baffled. I couldn't believe those numbers. And I started reading a lot, and it's hard these these times to find um, the right uh, opinion or the right information. There's for every argument, there's a ton of uh, articles to find that supported on, on both sides. So it's and especially with this this subject that is so, so complicated because so many of the articles um, I remember even watching a, a crypto movie of, of, of one hour and a half and I just turned it off after 45 minutes or so technically boring um, and 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 reading 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 and and then you see numbers from C Cambridge University and and those are like sources that you, you think you can uh, uh, um, trust and it was like no I cannot do this and and it was it was kind of hard because you 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 see in your community a lot of friends and colleagues turning a blind eye to to those issues and and I understand it. It's been a tough year. It's been uh, uh, many people lost a lot of money in work, and and it's very tempting to join. But I couldn't resist the feeling of like, without knowing it, it's not that it's hammered in in, in stone, but it, it looked to me like more like a scheme, like a pyramid scheme. And like, if you look at it from the perspective of of, of branding this, of putting this in, installing this in our world, in our culture. The whole sequence of events with with people and uh, it's nothing uh, towards the artist, but it's like the ideal artist to 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 shake this whole uh, scene up. Uh, artists known for making daily renders, making so much money with a daily render, uh, um, and and he has a huge uh, following. And I think it's like the price they paid for for, for the work is sixty nine million almost looked like, okay, this is the money we put aside to install this, this, new, um, this, this new system <laughs> uh, to, to almost turn us creatives and into art assets. Because I, I don't believe that the people who are buying this stuff are truly interested, generally interested in, 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 in our art. It's more that we become an, an asset. And for me, from, from out of my gut, uh, and it's not, this is not, not um, it's, it's just a, a gut feeling. It's like there's a huge, uh, some people with uh, lots of influence in the crypto uh, um, scene with lots of money. They, 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 they introduced this in, in a very clever way. And it was, I, I was really baffled to see how, how, how it exploded and how many people joined the, uh, and this at a time when I was like thinking with the next as by night, I'm going to celebrate um, detail again and, 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 and craftsmanship. And because I'm a bit sad also, like these days, all of us almost creating function of Instagram, of the crop of Instagram. It's like barely we, we go to websites, barely we, we see anything printed. And 
and I, I miss the craftsmanship. Maybe I'm getting old and grumpy. <laughs> That's some uh, uh, argumented, but there, there's. I'm, I'm really hungry for a more tangible world, and and this is going the opposite direction. And and for me, this this kind of technology in in this time of climate crisis that is so devastating for climate, I I find that retarded. How how do you have the balls to introduce such a platform in the in these times? I mean, even and there are alternatives that clearly um, um, use less energy and still people turn a blind eye. And it it's it's weird. And, and uh, people are so vocal online, and there's this cancel culture, but suddenly it's all quiet, and all this just happens. Um, and then they say that like, yeah, we'll move from. Uh, Proof of work, the proof of stake, but apparently that's also something uh, Ethereum has been promising for years. And and why do these platforms not use other currencies? Uh, and and so many other arguments. Uh, and and I don't want to be a, a hater or, or totally not, because because uh, I've had conversations with with people also that are planning to use new platforms that are even less. Uh, Energy consuming than than the the, the proof of uh, stake, uh, so I don't know. It's it's uh, um, I, uh, <laughs> uh, I I I agree, Dana, with with what Rizon is saying. Like, is it also like? Of course, there is a counter reaction on it that people say, okay, 50 MBs is the maximum resolution. I want to touch and feel and have craft again. So there's already a kind of a counter revolution uh, maybe starting. Um, is that oh, something, oh that, yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that something totally. that should be, yeah. of course, the ecological uh, should be solved. But what do you think? Is this um, staged? Is this like a, an idea of some clever people who, uh, who wants to push an interesting new way of investing? Or is it actually a, a good revolution for digital artists in that sense? Well, since we're living in these accelerationist times, I'm sure that there's clever investors that kind of jumped on the bandwagon and, and saw a way to push cryptocurrency. And I completely agree with Rizon, and it cannot be stressed enough that any issue there is with cryptocurrency that is having these high environmental and ecological costs need to be addressed and they need to be solved in an integral way, like we have to solve the whole um, ecological issue for our planet. Um, I'm not quite sure, however, so I'm also posing this as a question, if this is a problem with digital art or with the digital marketplace, because as Rizon is also saying, like, the more you start reading into this and you, the more you start to inform yourself, which I think is really a duty if you have to do if you want to work in this field, um, there's as many arguments pro and con. Um, and for some reason, I get the impression that the main problem is actually cryptocurrency. So this is, this is a capitalist problem that is being, I don't know, migrated from the actual world into the digital world. Um, and since it is more abstract, it's also harder to understand the cost. But the crypto cryptocurrency and the, and the mining, this is the most energy, uh, or this costs the most energy. And this is the most troubling event. The creation of a digital artwork is in a way having this the same kind of um, it's having the same kind of use of, of natural resources as painting or, or or theater or any art form. But as soon as you as it comes to the distribution of the files and the sharing of the files, um, then those costs start to add up. But at the same time, I think this is still a minor part. But really, I'm I'm completely open to be corrected here. But I think this is still a minor part. Uh, when you compare it to the, the cost of mining the cryptocurrency itself. So this is something that I find really hard to understand because um, is it the system and are we kind of uh, migrating a really damaging capitalist system to an online world and, and kind of falling back into the same 
pitfalls of, of mining, colonizing, extraction, and so on and so forth. And is this something that we can actually bypass or is it something we can solve? Um, maybe also Nick has more ideas about this because... Um, I found it interesting something yeah, you said about these maximum file sizes and stuff. Um, so this is also about just like keeping all these servers running. So what can be done there and can we diminish the cost or the environmental cost there? Yeah, N it's Nick, all you, a question. You've, you've of course thought about this and I already spoke about it with you. So you have also your ideas about it. What Definitely. I think, like, first of all, I'm I'm actually really glad that there's been such a you know uproar about the environmental uh, issues here, and I am also very confident that we are going to fix it. I'm already seeing platforms like running on the Tezos network, uh, one called uh, Hick et Nunts. I don't know if I'm saying it right, but it's Latin for here and now. I believe is like a, a very very small fraction of what the Ethereum network runs on, and a big problem with a lot of these platforms is that like. Every bid that's made, every auction, every you know tokenizing, everything is done on the blockchain, and it doesn't need to be. We can run the entire bidding auction process like eBay on a server, and I can even call you on the phone and whisper my 24-word secret password and give you my tokens on a burner wallet. We don't even need to be on the internet to exchange a token. So you can get rid of 90% of the costs right there by like just making better interfaces for this. So that needs to happen big time, and I'm totally... You know, it's very inefficient. And a lot of it, it doesn't need this crazy nuclear football level of security. For an artwork that costs $200, like, I can call you. We can do two-factor authentication with a QR code between me and the buyer. I end up talking to all my buyers anyway because I meet them and say thank you and whatever. So we can, I can exchange the token with them totally off-platform if we need to. So there's a lot of ridiculous amount of processing that's going on. It needs to be eliminated fast. And I'm glad that... Most of the developers I follow on Twitter and whatnot are jumping on this Tezos network and, and, and developing this. And it's not ready for mass consumption. And these, th these things take time. So right now, the Ethereum ones are popular. And this isn't going to happen overnight. But I am confident that we will move to a more sustainable you know, uh, version of this in the future. It's still very early. But um, also, like the, the whole idea of uh, the art market itself, I agree with a lot of... Uh, uh, Razan's uh, uh, <coughs> criticisms about about getting in, not just the environmental, but also the you know the feels like a pyramid scheme. But I mean, a lot of those comparisons can also be drawn to the art market. Look at the art fair world: thirty, fifty thousand dollar entry to get into an art fair, and then this art that's sometimes garbage, just like crypto art, is like pumped by these people that you don't have any access to as an artist. And there's a lot of comparisons to be drawn with that and the music industry. And yeah. in all honesty, I kind of see this moving to the way that the music industry is. I've been approached by a bunch of like, you know, record label type organizations that are like going to start a, you know, a new clique, like a record label. They're going to, um, you know, represent a bunch of digital artists and create a brand around a bunch of digital artists. And that's I, I see this kind of being almost more like the music industry than it is the art world in a lot of ways. Like, I mean, there'll be parallels and it'll be somewhere floating in between. But the business model of it is going to get more exclusive. It is really daunting to be like, oh, wow, a whole bunch of people just made a lot of money. I can, too. It's like, well, every day there's new NFTs, there's new toy collectibles, basketball videos, um, celebrities, uh, sports superstars posting a selfie. There's way more. Every day there's thousands more things that these few rich crypto people can buy. And there's only a few new crypto rich people buying the artwork. So that we're spreading very quickly the gap between how much art there is and how many collectors there are is getting very quickly, very fast far away so it's just yeah. like the early days of youtube there's a few people that got really popular on youtube and got big channels and everyone rushed in to try and do it and then it's like not everybody can have a popular youtube channel so now people have to work at it gain subscribers do great work and i think that's going to happen in the crypto world too you do great work and you work at it and build an audience and you know gonna have to do it the old-fashioned way right now there was a big rush and a bunch of people got lucky and it's crazy but it's like it'll even out and i think you know, I hope the environmental things get solved. I hope that the curation gets better because that's another big problem is that there's like, like, <laughs> like uh, Rizzo, yeah. Rizzo said, there's like some really bad artwork making a lot of money and it's really frustrating. But I mean, 
People thought that about EDM too, man. You remember how many people hated electronic music because it was like this easy, like repetitive beats and real musicians who learned guitar their whole life were so upset that EDM was this thing and it's this <laughs> stupid music. And, you know, it was just, I see a lot of parallels there too. It's, it's crazy times. Yeah, hey. I agree. If I can jump in, because yeah, I also think the whole pyramid scheme articles and, and, and that point of view is totally cutting out any type of collector that's only focusing on these kind of Bitcoin billionaires that have started kind of fueling really high amounts of money into buying NFTs. But I think there's also a group of collectors, like real collectors, that really like the work. And there's also new platforms coming that are much more curated um, I think what Koenig Gallery just did with their NFT drop and the artist is online is just been praised by the art world because it was a really strongly curated drop. Um, and I think also Foundation is doing an awesome job in, in really putting up amazing work. So I think the cool thing is it's so new that kind of everyone is jumping on it. And yes, that's people trying to make money, which is obviously... Um, the pyramid scheme story that we see and a lot of investors coming from China, from Singapore, who are not paying taxes. Um, but you also see this big stream of incredible new artworks being made, curatorial kind of settings coming in, either as galleries or as platforms themselves. Uh, it might be museums in the future focusing on doing drops. And more and more collectors are coming in, understanding how these wallets work, understanding um, the value of these works. Um, so, so I think there's a big change going on, uh, and I really believe it in the future. And another thing I wanted to drop in is that um, the documentary Made You Look um, really kind of struck my attention because it really, yeah, I did some research into the fake art market of kind of physical art and how huge that actually is that about 25% of all sold art in the art, the entire art market is fake. And, and the way the different cultures are looking into art, where in China, it's perfectly normal to make fake art. You're almost praised the better you are. So, so there it's more about experiencing the work and the work is, is open for everyone to make and to enjoy. Um, whereas in the Western world, it's very, very focused on that ownership, on being exclusive, on building your collection and putting it in a basement or your own museum and, and, and having this, yeah, it's, it's much more capitalist in a way. So what I really love about this, it's available for everyone. Everyone can enjoy it. It's similar to street art. And, and it, yeah, it really reminds me of a much more kind of democratic way where art is, is approachable for everyone. Every artist can drop their work. And the ownership um, is kind of opening up this whole new world of collectors where if you are 25 and you have a crypto wallet, you can just start buying or even a credit card. And, and for me, I think it will only be more collectors will be arising and collectors with a different eye and maybe also collectors that are not relying on the mind of these experts from the art world that have been the only people who can put value on an artwork. And, they're, and, and it's reliant on the memory of art world experts, a few galleries, a few auction houses, and now it's totally shifting. So yes, I definitely also agree with you, uh, Rizan, on... The, the environmental impact and on the fact that there's a lot of stuff out there trying to make money. But I really, really also want to emphasize the good things and, and that we're only scratching the surface and that this could become so big, um, so interesting and so kind of really like a big disruptor for the art world, uh, artists as well as collectors, that I really believe in, in, in the growth and seeing where this is going. Also, Meryl, because you were actually one of my experts when I started my kind of inquiry um, in, into this world, something that you mentioned when we spoke is also that it opens up the art world for people from different backgrounds. So it has the potential to make the art world more inclusive, people from countries that are maybe not able to travel with their physical art worlds. If somehow they manage to get a crypto wallet they can just 
enter this world. And I yeah. think this is also very much up to the artists. I mean, it's it's the time for the artists to kind of take the revolution in their own hands, yeah. because I don't want to go all kind of media uh, historical here, but we can actually learn a lot from film history and media history and the digital revolutions that have been happening there in terms of cinema being a mass medium. And it actually also created pos possibilities for independent creators. All right. Yeah, I, and it's also the perspective. So you're all of a sudden you're seeing African art, art from from the Middle East, maybe art from China, and that's all available and for you there to buy that you normally might not even be exposed to in the Western world. Rizom, what do you wanted to say? No, it's it's often that the it. it it gets co gets to be compared with the art world and how corrupt that is and, and all of that. But and and I agree, uh, uh, it's obvious what's happening in the the art world. But, but why why would you want us to compare to that? I mean, until now we always always been we've been digital artists. We 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 have platforms as Instagram, Behance, whatsoever to to promote our arts. From the moment you're uh, uh, you're a bit skilled, the job's going towards you. And I mean, the people that are now making a living or making good money on, on those platforms, NFT platforms, are artists that already were established. Um, the, I can clearly see who, 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 who's just dropping a Houdini tutorial and, and who's, 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 who's somebody with, with a legacy. And I mean, it's, it's giving... It giving a platform for anybody at every every skill level. I don't know. It's like when I was doing graffiti when I was 15 years old. I also felt I, as I was a neglected artist, and I deserved to be reckoned as an as an as an artist. Now, when I look back at it, I'm like, whoa, you were just a little boy, and you didn't deserve that that place. Or whatever. There's a route that you have to to uh, how do you say that? Um, that it takes time to to. To to earn your spot or or something. I mean, I, in in a fair way, it's an adventure. Um, and and now you you see, you see just people dropping uh, tutorials on on these platforms. And it, how, it's <laughs> Meryl, how do you look upon that as a curator? Because you had that sense building up uh, new expositions, etc. So you don't know where it comes from. There is no process. There is no trajectory. So how are you going to curate digital art in the future? You don't well, know. You, you don't always know if it's from Africa or China, or is it actually made by that person, or is it just wrapped by that person? Because there's also that that example of people who is like collecting uh, uh, basketball goals, uh, put it in an NFT and sold it for millions. So it's quite difficult to 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 find the original in that sense. Well, I think well. So two answers. One, to answer your question on, on knowing um, the maker, I think just as what Nick said, you are always in touch. I've bought quite a few NFTs and I'm always um, in conversation with the maker. So it's it's not as kind of, um, uh, how do you call it, like closed as you think. It's not you just buy a work, you like it. You follow the artists on their social channels, you start talking to them, you ask them how they made it, what's the story behind it. So, so before I buy or place a bid, I almost always start really kind of talking to the artists. And when we do that with Next, um, as Rizon just said, like you have to earn your stripes and you have to go through um, a whole career path. And, and I disagree. I think some artists can be at the top of their game when they make their first 10 works. You know, I, I don't think you necessarily have to follow all the steps that the traditional art world has laid out for everyone. You don't have to follow art school and go through hell. If you might, if you, if you can make incredible works like Ali Islami, we, we are, we're now working with, he hasn't done art school. He's making his own virtual reality. He's won a lot of, he's, he's won the golden calf and he's now been accepted to the Rijks Academy after winning the awards for the incredible work he made. Uh, I I totally agree. I mean, there, there are exceptions. Um, I didn't do art school either. <laughs> um, and it's it's not about what the art world has laid out for us, but you can clearly see that people who are just touching 3D software and doing a grayscale gorilla tutorial are dropping stuff on NFT. And, and like, it's, 
I mean, if, if, if you ask anyone on the street what you think, it's impressive. Of course, it's impressive, but it's just, I mean, yeah, I, I think it's, it's, it's so, I do call that, uh, it becomes all too easy to consume. Yeah. And that's the whole thing. It's like yeah. Tinder, it's NFTs, it's mm -hmm. all like fast paced consuming, and there's, there's little love or, or like it's, it, we don't have to leave our house anymore. It's just out of our sofa. Bah, 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 bah. <laughs> yeah, but I, I, I kind of agree with the tangibility aspect of it. And that's why I've, I've decided to also give single edition prints with my work because I'm just like, I still love having something as well to collect. And I think that's why a lot of people are doing those little digital screens and adding extra things. But there's some purist collectors who bought my stuff who didn't even ask me for the print. They don't care. They only want the, exactly. the digital to flaunt in their collection. I'm like, okay. But I but I also agree that the, the curation is so important here. Like I'm also seeing yeah. things where I'm like, I have that exact same 3D model I bought off of Turbo Squid, and some guy just put it in Cinema 4D, put a light on it, and he sold it for a hundred thousand dollars. Exactly. And not, and he did it 17 times. <laughs> and all he did, he took the, the the palm tree that's in the Cinema 4D library that everyone has, and threw it in there, and put a pink light, and boom, the guy's made two million bucks. And it's crazy. And it's like. The, but the collectors have no idea that it's that yeah. easy, that they can uh, go buy a $25 3D model and use a stock, you know, pink yeah. flamingo, and boom, you got you got $100,000. And I think that the collectors need to be educated because right now they're speculating on whatever's popular. One guy bought a piece for 100000 bucks, so they all buy a piece for 100000 bucks. And you see that going on with like CryptoPunks and all the other little collectibles that come out. It's all fad, flavor of the week stuff. And yeah. I saw two of those pieces today and yesterday where people have lost 60% on a sale because they're trying to liquidate right now because there's a bit of a crypto flop going on and there are people are trying to get rid of these pieces of crap and no one's buying them so i'm like I'm but always it's, focused. But it's that? interesting that you're saying nick but it's also like what marshall duchamp day or with ready mates mm -hmm. uh, it was also maybe it, it came from a shop next door and they put it on a pedestal and it was art right it's it's they well, put their name duchamp on it wasn't pretending that he made that uh you no. know toilet and that he was like no no but it's, it's also <laughs> it's also on the it, 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 of course, it's a track record, but it's also on the uh, on the public to decide what's art and what's yeah. not art That's in that true. sense. So That's it's true. It's and and it's to get an advisor on board, like be before I buy my NFT, I always do proper research. You know, I talk to 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 our curator, to Bogomir, to Jesse, to say like, you know, is this is this like complex enough? How is the skill set of the artist? Like, and I agree, people just buy because they think, you know, like I have to jump on this trend. But I think maybe that's kind of an interesting way that there should be much more kind of to or like like background information on the artist, background information on how it's made. Maybe people should start becoming kind of advisors in the field of what to buy and what not to buy. Mm -hmm. All right. well, well, Resume? Yeah, what I think is interesting is like it, just imagining is hyper uh, 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 how do you say, hypothetical. Um, it's like this thing started with the NFTs and the super NFT, da, da, da. and it's it's like what's happening now that we all are talking about NFTs and 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 it's 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 maybe this is getting much bigger as what they're anticipated. And it opens up conversations that will lead to new platforms that were totally not the intention of, of the people who originally started this. And that's that might be interesting. I'm really interested in the second wave, what comes after what these speculative people did. Yeah. And and like something that is built for, from a more genuine character. And that's definitely happening. And and I don't know if that's gonna be exactly like it is now. And and because for me now it's it's just a bunch of it, it, it starts to train us be, becoming a trader. Uh, uh, once you have that wallet, you will quickly open up uh, something else. But uh, I'm, <laughs> the, I, I'm really curious in that second wave because because it there's clearly a need and 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 and, and an energy that that needs to be pointed in. in yeah, a, in I, I think it's evolving, uh, Dana. Do you think it's there to last? Is it is it a hype at this moment, or is it like? Something that is now really the, the the how do you say the topic of today, and then slowly it will embed in 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 a more serious and more sustainable platform. And and uh, is is it there to last, or is it actually now, like Instagram, you can compare it a little bit. Was also it's using your content 
um, uh, for, for, for building their platform. And it was also a big involvement, of a big, it had a big influence on photography. For instance, like uh, it, it was because everybody was a photographer and it was like filters, so it looked cool and somebody could have like two million followers by just making nice food pictures in every restaurant, etc. You can say it's art or it's not art, but they are known as good food photographers in that sense. Um, is, it, is it like going into the liberalization of digital art or is it actually now getting back to more normal when it becomes more evolved in, in, in a good, strong, sustainable system? I think all of those, yes, it's a hype, but it's mostly a hype when you talk about the economical part. Um, and this is what's making it difficult because you have this entanglement of art and commerce. So it's really up to the art world and the creators themselves how they want to proceed and how they want to make this sustainable not only in a financial or an ecological sense, but also in an artistic sense. Um, on the other hand, I think it's here to stay because um, it's, an, it's aside from being like a commerce or a, or, a, or a marketplace or a form of trading, it's also a medium, but the medium already is also, from what I've seen so far, creating... Um, we, even within the realm of digital art, specific forms that I think also comment on cryptocurrency or the crypto world itself, like many of the of the historical avant-garde of the early 20th century were doing in all the different art for, forms that existed then. And this is where it also really has an aesthetic um, uh, importance does it look crappy and shitty and and completely <laughs> weird sometimes yes um but that's also that i really find fascinating but i really have like these two voices inside my heart one being super critical about it from a media historical perspective or an economical perspective and also I mean I think it's really the moment where we have to decide do we want to migrate capitalism to the digital realm and kind of just repeat the same stupid mistakes that we've been making all over but I'm also really fascinated because once again you have a medium that's also an art form, that's also a, a way of communicating, but also that contains a specific aesthetics that kind of belongs to this whole complex. And in that sense, I think it's it's definitely something that's going to stay, um, if only because all the, the new media forms that have been coming out of, of whether it be uh, moving media forms or, or digital forms, that are con still constantly evolving. So unless the internet dies, it's here to stay and we have to deal with it. And I think this is why we have to be aware and have to be responsible and keep asking those kind of questions about do we want, actually, do we want gatekeepers in the, in the way we have them in the old, old world? Is my newspaper going to have like a section for crypto art in the future because we're not visiting museums anymore and how are we going to talk about crypto art what are we going to talk about quality which is another elephant in the room that we're not discussing because it's such an amazing phenomenon or it's just such an economical phenomenon um but yeah of course quality and the investment and the development of an artist will come up at some point and then it's up to us how we want to deal with those questions I think that there's a big, um, <clears throat> the big question of like, oh wow, now look at this has put the power in the hands of the artists and the and the collectors and the middlemen are out. But there are some advantages to the middlemen too in the traditional art sense. Like right now, the biggest, I think most people are really pissed off at NFTs because of the annoying social media aspect of it. It's turned Twitter into an auction house because a lot of these platforms have, like literally we're talking about a few dozen big collectors that everyone is vying for the attention of and everyone's on Twitter posting every bid and bragging about big sales and filleting their collectors online in on Twitter and it's for people that aren't in the game, it is super annoying and I'm very aware of it. And I have, I'm sure some of my Twitter followers are like, 
screw that guy. He and like uh, I I try not to post like that I made a sale. Or, but you're seeing people being like, I just made forty thousand dollars and holding up their big novelty check like they won the lottery over and over and over again every day. I'm posting every bid that everyone's done, and it's crazy. But we also live in the world now where people are posting their loss porn on Reddit that they lost three hundred thousand dollars. So maybe this younger generation and this world is now just like your wallet is on your sleeve and everyone knows financially what's going on but you would have never posted that you just made fifty thousand dollars from pepsi on a contract on twitter or you would be a total douchebag and everyone would hate you like it's just it's kind of i think the crypto art space needs an etiquette uh reset like it's kind of annoying and i get why a lot of people hate it and but also that's why maybe something that bridges the gap where there are some bit of a middleman to take the financial bidding and the annoying part out of the system and like kind of keep that separate from your social media bragging profile. I don't know. <laughs> that that just feels, as an artist, even me, I feel like I need to take a shower sometimes after I promote my work on, on social media. And a lot of artists are like that. They don't want to whore themselves out on their platforms and post eight times a day that something is for sale. They don't want to be a salesman for their own art. Unless I'm just going to say something speculative here, because we were talking about Duchamp, and as we all know, he wasn't even the creator of that piece. I mean, not in the literal, but also in the artistic sense. But unless I'm just kind of, um, yeah, fantasizing here, the narrative around this crypto work actually becomes an integral part of what the work is. Mm -hmm. And this is something that. I think we should consider from a philosophical point of view, because this is also something that's happening, has been happening in art history for the last hundred or so years, yeah. is actually that the context and um, the narrative and the value of the work have become an integral part of the meaning of that work. So yeah. this, I mean, once again, I have no value judgment about this, but I find this immensely fascinating mm -hmm. that actually the fact that that and this is kind of a philosophical counterpart of the blockchain because it's the whole story that belongs to the artwork. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and and if I can just um, go back to your question, uh, Leon, about is it here to stay? Um, I think one thing that I do hope that's here to stay, and then as a side note, that they do need to solve um, the mining and the CO two problem. But I hope that's the blockchain and using the blockchain to actually document what is going on. And then going back to that documentary made you look, I think I also bought a piece by Trevor Jones, which is he makes paintings and he sells them um, as an NFT on a platform. But you also get the real painting um, sent to your house. I didn't. Yeah. Um, um, so I think what is interesting there. Um, and what is definitely, I think, a benefit for the art world that it, let it be a physical work or a digital work, that the documentation is totally transparent, um, that you can, you know, that, that forgery is, is, is way harder and that you can just look into this transparent system and see who bought it, where, in which museum or collection has it been, uh, when was it made, has it been you know, put on the market by the original maker. And also the fact that the artist always keeps a percentage whenever it's sold on the secondary market. I think I really hope that those two things are really there to stay to kind of, yeah, really create transparency and more governance in the art world. And I've seen a lot of plans for expansion into the music world where you could kind of link up crowdfunding where you where a, bu a bunch of your fans could buy the NFT for your album ahead of time. You get a hundred thousand dollars to make your album and then everyone can profit share on the on the streaming platform or something like that. And like a lot of interesting ideas are kind of presenting themselves that could also help everyone make money, democratize things even more. And, uh, you know, it's going to be interesting going forward. So I think it's here to stay, but it will morph into many different things. Can I ask like one, 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 one last question, um, uh, which I was like, I, I don't know, maybe it's a total uh, uh, dumb question. I re really don't know. But I hear in discussions the fear that in the future, maybe we were talking about that it will be lost, that it becomes behind a paint wall. So that like, like this ownership, uh, uh, this, this legal aspects, uh, 
uh, will end up. Now, internet is giving us like the opportunity to see all the uh, a lot of digital imagery we want to see, but that maybe in the future some people will put it behind a paid wall. Like, like for instance, uh, uh, Netflix is has a, having a collection, and Disney is having their own collection, and and uh, the Guggenheim has their own collection, but it's more of course. So that it actually will end up. Um, behind walls and it will not liberate but it actually will exclude digital art from an audience is that, does then that could that make sense i really don't know of but course, it's one of, of the course, questions but yeah. then you will get i mean you will get a new form of piracy because this is this is what's been happening in the in the cinema world um you you get piracy because it is an artwork that is in essence um uh, made to be copied. It's a mass medium. It's it actually it doesn't exist for the original because it's counter counterintuitive thinking when you think about what the medium is. The medium is something that is reproducible. So you will get piracy and people won't care about the original anymore. So you have to solve that somehow. And besides that, I also feel that. Um, like physical world museums should also be free. Yeah. Hey, uh, Merel, because that's also something that, that will maybe involve you in the future. Like now you are having direct contact with artists about exposing their work, of uh, exhibiting their work. And um, so direct contact and you agree on it, but maybe it's not their work anymore or not totally their work anymore because maybe there is like they, they already sold it to a collector uh, and you have to reach out to a collector to make it part of your exposition. Uh, do you see, f and also the legal aspects of it, and what, you, what, what just Dana is also saying, like the, the physical thing will become less important sometimes than actually the NFT. So how, are you how do you look upon as, 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 as a museum of new media? So I think that let's say so if I'm looking in the future and and we want to you know show more and more digital art I think I would be inclined to work with the artist rather than with the one who collected because the artist will always have their artist proof and then I think the the, the licensing the, the 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 money that they get for the the licensing fee should always go directly to the artist but that's kind of now how, how we would like to work in, in the short run, maybe in the long run, it would be presenting a collection of a collector. Um, but I think then it's interesting that it's, it is in the blockchain that if he sells it, that the artist gets a certain percentage, but there's nothing written yet about can they show it, yes or no. Mm -hmm. But in, in my head, as a, um, to, to keep your integrity as a museum, our job is to support the artist. So if we would ever do that, then 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 we should always pay a licensing fee to the artists themselves. I think that that should be written in the contract. That should be um, if you ever commercialize the work, so to say, to sell tickets and to get people there, it would always be a fee going back to the to the maker. Yeah, what do I, you think, Rizal? Yeah, yeah. I was wondering, like, um, I never seen such a contract, like. What are your rights uh, as an artist, uh, Nick? Uh, what can you do with the work once you sold it? Uh, most of these platforms are saying that you retain all copyright and these people have bought the token. They, they own that token and that is it. But I mean, we haven't seen a lot of NFT lawsuits yet and I'm still waiting to kind of see some precedent set here because not only that, we've also got all kinds of crazy trademark copyright issues going on. It's rampant in the space. I'm seeing Star Wars art. I'm seeing even Beeple sold one of like Shrek and I'm like, okay, yeah, Banksy can paint Mickey Mouse. You can do Shrek, but did you buy that 3D model from Turbo Squid and did it say editorial only? And are you commercializing it now by selling a hundred editions? I don't know. It's kind of sketchy, and I think there's going to be a big lawsuit, and we're going to figure a bunch of stuff out, and it's going to set the rules yeah. moving forward, and that hasn't been done yet. I so, think that is a collection in itself, uh, an exhibition in itself, I think. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, to test the waters and see what happens. I, I, I also wonder, like, the, the people that invented this uh, ownership certificate, what, what is the legal framework? What What does it mean in court? Is it is it an ownership <laughs> certificate? Yeah. I don't know. It's a... It all needs to be tested. It really does. I it, Those are very important questions, and I, I think they will 
you know, be tested. I guarantee they will. I guarantee Disney has got a team of lawyers figuring out how to test this right now. <laughs> yeah. The other thing is, like, Disney is inevitably going to enter the same space. They yeah. are going to sell Star Wars collectibles, guaranteed. They are on. They already have it ready to go. So, are you going to be able to sell a Disney collectible in the same space as a as Disney? Like, I doubt it. Like, I don't think that's going to fly in the long run. It's, you know. But does Disney make their own art gallery and sell art beside Banksy's, you know, Mickey Mouse prints? Like, I don't know. It's a it's a hard hard thing to say where the line is drawn there with mm -hmm. trademark characters and things like that. All right. Thank you so much for the discussion. Uh, we discussed like a lot of topics and I hear already a lot of new topics rising. Uh, so maybe like in a few months we can discuss a lot of lawsuits and plunging uh, stuff <laughs> and maybe they solve the, uh, uh, the carbon footprint already. So there's like a lot of stuff at least got moving, it got in motion, right? So it's, it's really in that sense uh, a really interesting topic to discover also in the future. I really want to thank Rizom, I want to thank Merel, I want to thank Nick and I want to thank Dana for joining us today in this discussion on NFTs. Uh, I hope to see you next time at a new edition of Playgrounds TV. So if there are any topics, if there are any questions, if there are any doubts you would like to discuss on this table, please send us an email. You can find everything on our website, uh, www.weareplaygrounds.nl, and we're sure we, uh, we will discuss it uh, with, a, with a great team. Thank you so much, and uh, for the audience, see you next time. Bye-bye. 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 <laughs>